Good morning and welcome to the online edition of the 2021 Compliance Conference. I'm actually speaking to you from Birmingham, where we've been holding today the physical conference. And, uh, and I have to tell you, it's been an amazing experience. I think we've had about 600 people in the room. Uh, uh, we've been taking a multitude of selfies in the marketplace, uh, just proving that we were here uh, with real people having interesting conversations. Um, it's altogether uh, very overexciting. So, um, I hope you get a similar value from, uh, from the virtual conference that you'll be attending today. We, uh, we heard from you last year where um, an unbelievably large number of people in the profession watched uh, some, if not all, of the uh, compliance conference events, uh, that you really liked the virtual uh, um, offer. Uh, and that you particularly like the opportunity to share um, the, the, the sessions, especially the ones that you found particularly interesting with your colleagues uh, back in the office. So, so this year we're, we're doing both uh, the physical event, but also uh, a, a virtual event. And I think really importantly, you also told us that you liked to be able to interact uh, and have the opportunity to ask uh, questions uh, in the sessions. So, so we're not just giving you a virtual version of the physical conference, we're giving you uh, 11 different sessions uh, on uh, topics from AML to, uh, to compliance and uh, all the things in between. Um, and you will have the opportunity in every one of those uh, to uh, ask questions and have answers uh, from the, the, the panels of speakers. Um, so, so I hope it lives up to expectations. We're really keen to hear what you think about it uh, because next year we will want to tweak uh, um, to uh, give even more value. Um, hoping more of you will want to come to the physical event because it is a great opportunity, but this is a uh, virtual offer is also a way to extend our reach and uh, talk to more of you. So, so, so maybe both, but, but let's hear back from you. Um, what you'll also have the opportunity to see tomorrow is a, an interview uh, with myself and Paul Phillip. Uh, so Clive Murray, who chaired the conference uh, in Birmingham, uh, interviewed us both and uh, uh, that was great fun too. And I hope you'll find uh, that interesting and want to see it uh, when, you, uh, when you're able. So uh, really just nothing more to say except I uh, hope you enjoy it and uh, let's get on with the first session which is on AML. And welcome to Virtual Cop Coffer 2021 and welcome to this session on anti-money laundering or AML for compliance professionals. Um, so how this is going to work is in a moment you're going to see a recording of the presentation from the session that we did at the Physical Compliance Conference last week. Um, but we want this session to be as interactive as possible. So after we've screened the video, we'll have some time for some new live question and answers. And we have all of the panelists that spoke at the conference last week. Uh, so that's myself, Colette Best, Director of Anti-Money Laundering at the SRA. Uh, also Zoe Allen Robinson from the SRA and Natalie Maloney from Heinz Solicitors. Uh, so we're all here to offer insight from the law firm uh, perspective and on an AML perspective and to answer all your questions. So if you want to ask a question, uh, what you need to do is click at the link below this broadcast and submit your question. Um, it's nice to know your name, uh, but you can submit questions anonymously if you would rather. So I'm not going to take up any more time now. I uh, we'll look forward to, to getting lots of questions through to answer in a moment. Uh, but first, on to the presentations. Um, so I've got a, a short slot this morning, uh, and thank you very much for, for choosing to come to this breakout session. Um, so I'm going to be covering off a little bit about our role as a supervisor um, and some of the stuff that we've seen in the past year of AML supervision. So why don't I kick off for talking uh, a little bit about our role as an AML supervisor, how we, we supervise in this area, because we get a lot of questions about that. Um, so we have a variety of tools in our toolkit for preventing and detecting money laundering. 
Um, but our primary tool and, and our preferred tool is providing information, advice and guidance to help you comply with the money laundering regulations, uh, which can be really complex and really quite burdensome. Um, so there is a wealth of resources online to help you comply, and that ranges from uh, legal sector affinity group guidance um, to um, thematic reviews, our risk outlook, which uh, there's a breakout session on later. Um, and in fact, uh, Zoe will be coming on to talk a little bit about the results of a thematic review, which we published this morning. Um, and we also share information uh, that's really important in this area. So we share information with other supervisors um, and also with law enforcement agencies where they have the potential to, to help prevent money laundering. So the second uh, big tool in our toolkit is proactive supervision, uh, and that's going to be the focus of, of this session today. Uh, and that falls into to really three categories. Uh, so we do uh, desk-based reviews, we do visits, and we do thematic reviews. Um, and I'll often get asked what happens uh, if you're selected for a visit. So if you're selected for a visit, we'll get in touch with you. Um, we'll ask you to book a slot that works for you for us to come and visit you. And we are back to doing visits face to face now uh, after a brief hiatus and we did them online. Um, if you do get an email from us saying book a visit, I will say that the furthest away visits book up by far the quickest. So if you want the best uh, selection of slots, get in there quick. And then we'll ask you to send us some information ahead of the visit. Uh, we'll ask you to send us your policies, procedures and controls, your firm-wide risk assessment and a list of fee earners. And then on the day when we come in, we'll be uh, asking to speak to your MLRO, your money laundering reporting officer, your money laundering compliance officer and some fee earners. And we'll also be doing some file reviews. And we recently visited Natalie, uh, who will be talking today uh, or in just a moment about her experiences of how that visit went for her. And so briefly on to enforcement. Um, so this is where we do take action where either money laundering has occurred or the firm is, is failing seriously in its obligations to prevent money laundering. Um, and we do have uh, uh, quite a lot of cases that involve money laundering, so I think we're at around 200 at the moment, um, ranging from uh, sort of more minor uh, technical breaches uh, right the way up to cases where, where money laundering has taken place. Uh, and we obviously take enforcement action, bring enforcement action in line with our uh, enforcement strategy and AML topic guide. And in all of this work, uh, we ourselves have a supervisor as well. Uh, we're overseen by our oversight supervisor, Opbas. Uh, so they come in and audit us. Uh, we had an audit at the beginning of the year and we have to comply with their source book. So this is just uh, quite a, a brief slide to talk about uh, our last year in numbers. Um, so as you can see, we're very active in the preventing money laundering space and taking action where we found issues. Um, and one thing that I will say is that we are stepping up the number of visits to firms that we do. So your chance of being visiting by us, uh, visited by us uh, is increasing year on year. And we've recently published a report uh, which all the information that I'm speaking about uh, is, is drawn from, so do uh, look that up online. It covers off all of the AML supervision that we did in the last year, and that's the financial year, April uh, 2020 to April 21. Um, but there's lots of examples of good practice and things to avoid in there, so uh, well worth a read if you get a moment. So these are our headline findings from uh, the past year of AML supervision. Um, so firstly, often get asked, um, is it the big firms that you're bringing enforcement action against all the time? Is it small firms that you see doing really badly here? And actually what we find is that size isn't a good correlation for how well firms are doing in preventing money laundering. Um, we really do see good practice across the spectrum. Uh, and that's not to say that there's not different challenges, uh, depending on, you know, if you're a big firm, you've probably got a dedicated AML compliance function. Um, but certainly being a small firm or indeed being a large firm is, is no barrier to, to preventing money laundering. 
Use of technology has really picked up in this year, uh, which of course includes the pandemic, um, which is great. Uh, some of the tech that is out there is, is really fantastic. Um, so lots of really good solutions, uh, particularly helpful if you're dealing with non-face-to-face -face clients. A couple of little pointers if you are choosing to use technology. Um, firstly, make sure that you understand what it's doing. Um, so make sure you understand, for example, what data sources your uh, technology provider is using, how often they're refreshing them uh, so that you don't get into to difficulties that way. Um, and don't delegate your decision making to your IT systems. Uh, all the IT system is doing is, is running a name against uh, a various uh, spectrum of databases. It's you at the firm that is need to be taking an informed decision about is this client and is this instruction something that we actually want to take on. Um, and I've also made a note to say, take care against user error as well. Um, so we have seen firms, in fact, we've seen an enforcement case where um, a firm missed the fact that the client was a pet because someone misspelled their name wrong uh, in the due diligence system. So just make sure that, that you're using the technology correctly. Um, training, uh, so we see good training as a really good proxy for a good AML outcomes. It does seem to be uh, sort of the magic bullet in uh, making sure firms are doing well in preventing money laundering. So it's really important to make sure that when you're doing training, make sure that firstly you're training people on the regulations and requirements, um, but also really important to make sure they understand what your policies, procedures and controls are. So does everyone in your firm know where to go, who to speak to, what to do if they come across something that uh, raises a red flag with them? Um, and then the next point is uh, firms having good policies, but they're not actually following them in practice, which is something that we see a lot. Uh, and it really ties into uh, the, the last point. So make sure that you are uh, training and supervising your fee earners to make sure that the policies that you've written, you've invested loads of time in doing so, um, are actually being used. And that's not to say that you can't deviate from your policies at all ever. Um, it's absolutely fine to take a risk-based approach on a client, um, but make sure that that is documented. Um, and then, yeah, finally, uh, in terms of risk, it really does continue to be convincing where we see the greatest number of files um, with issues, um, both enforcement action and the suspicious activity reports that, that we submit. Um, so I'm going to be speaking about this a bit more later this afternoon, so I won't labour this point, but convincing does seem to be the issue uh, where things go wrong. So let me talk a little bit uh, for two slides about specific findings that uh, we, we found when we went to visit firms in the last year or so. Uh, so kicking off with firm-wide risk assessment. So if you were here two years ago, you've already heard me say loads about this area. Um, it's really important to get your firm-wide risk assessment right because so much flows from that in terms of your approach to risk. Um, but we're still seeing firms not getting this basic uh, facet of the, the, the regulations right. Um, there's loads of guidance available online. There's a toolkit, there's a template. You don't have to use a template, but if you are using a template, either ours or someone else's, make sure it is tailored to your firm. Uh, we do see an awful lot of standard text. Uh, we also on occasion still see templates with insert phone name here on it, which is uh, clearly not, not a good indicator. And then the issues that we're seeing with firm mode risk assessments when they're in place is uh, mandatory risk factors being left off. And the key ones are uh, not accounting for transaction risk, uh, and that's followed by delivery channel risk. Uh, so moving on then to talk a little a bit about policies, procedures and controls. Uh, again, really basic, really important thing to get right. Um, but at visits, we found uh, at over half of visits, some of these needed some changes. And two main issues are um, either it not being kept up to date, so um, it's not updated for, say, the 2019 amendment regulations, um, or emissions, and the most common emissions from policies, procedures, and controls we're seeing is no policy on uh, clients from high-risk third countries, 
no uh, information on transactions that might facilitate anonymity, uh, and no information on the use of reliance. Um, so then on to, to say a word or two about audit. Um, so this is something we flagged in our report, not this year gone, but the year before as being a really uh, big issue. Uh, and the number of firms that we're seeing uh, where we have to uh, offer guidance or, or follow up on audit is still really high. So you must get an independent audit where it's appropriate to the size and nature of your firm. Uh, but independent doesn't necessarily mean external. Uh, so it could be someone in your firm uh, if they're not involved with um, uh, writing your policies, procedures and controls. And so the failures that we're seeing in audit is either uh, it not being carried out or it not being sufficiently robust. Um, and then on just to say a word quickly about employee screening. Again, this was another big area that we flagged uh, last year and it continues to, to be a problem for firms. Um, so you'll remember that the requirement for screening is fourfold, uh, so you must do checks on employees when they join your firm, but also on an ongoing basis, and then you must check for skills and experience and conduct and integrity. And what we're seeing is firms are doing a really good job uh, on appointment and uh, skills and experience is being done really well. Um, but where firms are struggling is integrity on an ongoing basis. And this is obviously quite a, a challenging area. Um, and through all of this, I'd stress the risk-based approach. So make sure you're doing appropriate screening to the level of risk uh, that that person uh, has the opportunity to prevent. Um, and make sure that you're using a variety of different sources as well. Don't just rely on uh, self-declarations. So moving on to findings from reviews part two. So this is all uh, surrounding issues with customer due diligence. Um, and what we find is that firms are doing the, the basic ID and V identification verification of clients pretty well. Um, but there are still issues with, um, with other aspects of client due diligence as set out uh, on this slide. Um, so we, I mentioned this earlier, but we do still see issues where the policy of the firm says one thing and then customer due diligence uh, has, has actually happened differently. So an example of that might be uh, conveyancing is rated high risk um, and um, it's then rated low risk when uh, actually you're taking on clients or you say in your policies, procedures and controls that you don't use reliance, but then it is relied upon uh, in a specific file. Um, matter risk assessment. So uh, we're seeing about a third of files with problems with matter risk assessments. Um, and the, the issues that we're seeing are two quite easy ones to get right, actually. So either matter risk assessments aren't being done at all, or the risk isn't rated uh, low, medium or high. Uh, so that's quite a, a, an easy one to take away. Source of funds, uh, we still see problems with and have seen problems with in the last year, which I know is a, a really tricky and challenging area. Um, so the regulations require both source of funds and source of wealth checks for specific circumstances. Um, so transactions uh, with uh, parties in high risk third countries um, and also politically exposed persons. Um, but for everyone else, it's required where necessary. And of course, where necessary isn't defined. So again, uh, I'd stress the risk-based approach, uh, and unless your transaction is low risk, you're probably going to be wanting to do some source of fund check as appropriate to the level of risk uh, posed by the transaction. Um, and we have seen some really good practice in this area. Um, so we've seen firms uh, doing this early. That does seem to be the key. Uh, and asking questions in the initial client care letter. Some things that we saw that weren't quite so good were obtaining records without reading them. So we saw some instances where bank accounts had been attained, which were clearly fake. You know, they had typos all over them. So a, a cursory read of them uh, would, have, would have demonstrated that to the firm. Um, and the other issue we saw was making assumptions about the client's general wealth, but not understanding where the funds for this particular transaction came from. And ongoing monitoring, finally, uh, we're seeing a bit of a mixed picture here, um, but I guess the key points are to make sure that you are doing ongoing monitoring of transaction 
transactions. And if you're getting information that says that the risk level has changed, make sure that you're gaining uh, additional information to, to mitigate that risk. So final slide for me, uh, before I hand over to Zoe then, is um, I think it's worth acknowledging that this is a really challenging area. It's been you know, a really challenging year for everyone. It is burdensome, uh, the regulations. It is a difficult area to comply with. Um, and I think I should thank all the firms that, that we visited in the last year or so uh, under quite difficult circumstances because they've been uh, nothing but helpful. Um, we are seeing improvements in compliance and we are seeing lots of firms taking a really thoughtful and considered approach to preventing money laundering, which is great. Um, that said, we are still seeing uh, some levels of non-compliance uh, that I spoke about and I guess issues with firms just getting the real basics right of uh, firm-wide risk assessments, policies, procedures and controls uh, and customer due diligence. Um, but there are loads of resources out there to help you comply uh, and do please get in touch if, if there's resources that you think that we could be helpfully providing you with. Um, so now I am going to hand over to Zoe, uh, who's going to be talking about our guidance for money laundering reporting officers and money laundering compliance officers. So hot off the press, I'm going to talk about our latest thematic project on the role of money laundering compliance officers and money laundering reporting officers, which I'll refer to as MLCO and uh, MLRO as I, I go through, because both bit of a mouthful. Um, so the report was actually published yesterday, um, and we recognise from our work and engagement with firms the importance of these roles um, within the AML regime, but also the challenges that role holders face in terms of juggling their responsibilities under the regulation but also other responsibilities if you're, you've also got a fee earning capacity or if you act as the compliance officer for legal practice. So the rationale um, behind doing this project was to understand from firms themselves how they manage this, who fulfills these roles, what makes a good MLRO and MLCO and what challenges they face. We also wanted to see what lessons could be learned and shared with the profession and how to manage a firm's AML regime successfully. And the aim of the project was to produce some practical, helpful guidance to new and existing MLCOs, MLROs, which we have published, and it includes a checklist, so, so do check those out. I'm going to run through the key points from, for you today, um, and also on some of the slides I'll be sharing some sound bites from firms that aren't included in the report. So in terms of what did we do, we contacted 50 firms, um, initially sending them a questionnaire for them to complete with, that focused on these roles, and then we chose 24 of those 50 firms to visit. So we conducted one of our usual assessments of compliance, which we do on a rolling basis, which involves interviews, reviewing, reviewing policies, controls and procedures and files. And then we also focused in on these roles and spoke to the MLCO and the MLRO if they were different people. And in total, we spoke to 30 role holders, um, and we find about 10% separate out the role. And we also spoke to our own MLRO to get her thoughts on, on what is important. And in terms of the legal requirements, these are quite sparse, as you can see from the slide, but they are very significant requirements. So the roles only apply to firms within scope of the regulations. So law firms' activities tend to fall under Regulation 11 and Regulation 12. So that's things like conveyancing, trust and company service uh, work, for example. And every firm within scope of the regulations need to, needs to have an MLRO, including very small firms. So even sole practitioners need to have one, which would be themselves if they employ other people. But firms only need to appoint an MLCO if it's appropriate to their size and nature. This isn't defined in the regulations, but in reality, most practices will need to appoint somebody unless they are the principal and they have direct involvement within all matters within scope. So while these requirements are brief, um, they do ca carry considerable duties, and an MLCO can delegate some of those responsibilities, but overall compliance does rest with them. At one of the firms we visited, the MLCO delegated large parts of their roles to the MLRO, and when we asked them about training, they weren't able to answer us or, or let us know what happened at their firm. Um, because they have that overall responsibility, we would expect them to at least have a high-level understanding of what is happening in terms of training at the firm. 
And we also expect the MLCO to be our point of contact. So the work that Colette spoke about, if we're contacting firms for a visit or a desk-based review, we will contact the MLCO and our questions will be posed to them and we'll expect them to, to liaise with us. And we also expect them to have a detailed knowledge of the firm's AML regime and a sound understanding of the policies, controls and procedures. So in terms of the MLRO, their primary duty is to make suspicious activity reports to the National Crime Agency. And they can potentially face criminal liability if they fail to carry out this duty properly. Um, the role is also likely to involve uh, advising on how to deal with clients while you're waiting to hear back from the National Crime Agency without alerting the client to the fact a report has been made. And they're referred to in the regulations and the proceeds of Crime Act as a nominated officer. So with the 10% of firms that decided to separate out these roles, we did ask them why they chose to do that. And some of them found that that was a fairer division of the work. They found that the role of MLCO sat well with senior management and having someone else do the MLRO role. They also found that the MLCO role sat neatly with the role of, of compliance officer for legal practice. And also by separating out the roles, it increased the number of people that fee earners could approach um, with money laundering queries. But firms should make this decision based on your own business, the types of service you provide. We certainly wouldn't say you have to separate out the roles. That's a decision for you to make as appropriate to your, to your firm. And I would also stress that AML officers are not the only people responsible for, for tackling money laundering. Your fee earners, your admin staff, finance staff, they are the first line of defense in spotting this and, and dealing with it. And it's for these AML officers to, to lead. So in terms of how we structured the report and the, the key findings, we, we've structured it under three key pillars. And we know that MLCOs and MLROs are key in preventing financial crime and ensuring compliance with the regulations. And the success of a firm's AML regime is likely to, to depend on having people that are suitably knowledged and skilled to carry out these roles. And in, in our report, we set out what we, what we consider to be the key requirements, which neatly sort of fall under these three headings. So in terms of authority, we're talking about the ability to command respect, to make decisions and to follow them through to completion, and the ability to access all information held by the firm. In terms of independence, we're looking for a focus on the firm's legal obligations rather than short-term gain, the ability to make decisions without being influenced by clients or fee earners or senior members of the firm and then resources to be given the time and space to consider what the best course of action should be and to have provision where possible for a deputy or other people to support you in terms of colleagues. So in terms of authority, and you can see what some firms have said on the screen there about what is important, who should they be? So they should be sufficiently senior in the firm. The only seniority requirement is in relation to the MLCO, who must be a member of the, of the senior management or the board. And as you can see from the comments, in reality, both role holders will need to have a certain amount of authority in their role. And an AML officer is likely to make com have to make commercially unpopular decisions and turn away work which on the face of it could appear lucrative. And they'll also need to be prepared to overrule senior members of staff or to ask senior members of staff to, to undertake certain activities like training. So in terms of, um, we found that the overwhelming majority of MLCOs, 87%, were equity partners or equivalent. And the MLRO doesn't have this requirement, but they will still need unquestioned access to data and support from the MLCO and the wider management team if they're to be effective. We also found in terms of authority, it's important to lead by example and for the AML officers to model the behaviours that they expect from the fee earners. One of the firms we spoke to said that it was a cornerstone of their AML regime to foster a culture in which junior fee earners could speak up and not feel under pressure to accept all work that was coming their way. And the MLCO modelled this by being selecting themselves about which clients they, um, they undertook and, and also balancing that risk as well as reward for each client. And commitment to compliance can be tested in other ways. One thing that was really encouraged to hear from a firm was that they tested that in interview stage. So when they were interviewing people, they made it clear how important the compliance culture was at the firm and wanted to check that the people they were hiring had the, the similar attitudes and beliefs to the, the firm. 
Another important factor to authority is being able to determine the firm's risk-based approach and risk appetite. So this is a function which I would say technically sits with the money laundering compliance officer, not the MLRO, but if they were separate people, you'd want to get the MLRO's thoughts on that when you're, you're determining your risk-based approach. And you need to have an intimate knowledge of the business, the types of clients and services. So it's likely that someone will need to be in the role for a bit of time before they can they fully feed into the risk-based approach of the firm and appetite. So in terms of good practice around authority, it's important they have the authority and respect from the firm to influence colleagues at every level, ensuring that they have the final say in AML matters and potentially writing this into the firm's governance documents and giving AML officers the widest possible access to firm systems and information in order to determine the risk-based approach. We also found it good practice involving fee earners and colleagues in determining the firm-wide risk assessment and, and updating it, and also stress testing the AML regime by undertaking file reviews, for example. And the other thing in terms of authority, trying to maintain your fee earners' interest in the subject by making training and policies, controls and procedures relevant and user-friendly for fee earners. Another important soundbite from the firms, um, as you can see on screen, is stressing the importance of decision making and being able to report on suspicious activity without interference, so not having someone you have to run past your suspicious activity report and potentially they could be watering down that message, so also really important. So in terms of the second pillar, independence, we consider this to be a crucial attribute for both MLCOs and MLROs. An MLCO needs to be independent enough from the influence of colleagues, clients and other pressures to steer the firm in a compliant direction. And they also need to be able to make decisions objectively and where necessary free from any business constraints. They need to be able to speak up against senior voices who may wish to take them down a superficially profitable but a risky uh, route. And they'll need to be able to challenge clients and potentially end long-standing uh, and lucrative business arrangements if the risk is perceived to be too high. And in terms of resistance from colleagues, 20% explain they didn't encounter resistance as such, but did encounter sort of moans and grumbles about compliance. Others, however, said that they had a culture that encouraged compliance and there was no resistance at all. And they ascribe this to, as you can see from, from the quote on, on screen, explaining to clients at the outset why they need certain documents and what they need really fostered good client relationships. Using practical examples in training that was relevant to fee earners' work, also explaining the potential consequences of the firm being involved in money laundering and making sure that fee earners understand the reasons for these requirements and reinforcing Fiona's personal responsibility for AML measures, rather than assuming it's the role of AML officers and compliance staff, which I know from speaking to MLCOs can be really challenging when you're trying to get that buy-in across the firm. And then continuing with independence, one, one firm also flagged the importance of having procedures to check that um, compliance is, is being undertaken with the legislation and going by the mantra, how could I explain this in court, uh, which is really relevant to a successful AML regime, it, ensuring you record your rationale, as, as Colette spoke about earlier, if, if an area is usually high risk, but that particular file is considered low risk, making sure you make a note of your, your decision. And another tip for smaller firms would be to buddy up with other role holders, maybe in another firm, to, to help support you in that. So good practice is making sure around independence you still have the support of your wider colleagues, that you have the final say and autonomy about significant decisions, such as reporting suspicions, and giving support to fee earners when dealing with client resistance, and being empowered to make decisions and stand by them, even if they could be unpopular. So moving on to the final pillar, which is resources. So when we talk about resources, we don't just mean financial resources. Firms need to ensure that AML officers are given appropriate means to carry out their role. So this could be support from colleagues. It could be budgetary resources where applicable, for example, training or additional staff. But I think the key to this is time. Um, and as well as partnership roles, the challenge was that the majority of AML officers had several other roles at the, at the firm wearing several hats. 
So this could be managing partner, compliance officer for legal practice, um, COFA, data protection officer, the list went on. And the average number of roles held was, was three, but it, it was as much as five roles at some firms. And this leaves aside sole practitioners, which we reviewed, who all wor worked alone and necessarily held all of the roles at the firm. So when we asked firms how they balanced these various demands on their roles, over a fifth explained that they were encountering or had encountered difficulties in balancing them. And AML officers should be careful to make sure they're not overloaded. These, these two roles are onerous and time-consuming, and they demand a significant investment of time to do properly. And by way of illustration, we asked firms how long it took them to submit a suspicious activity report. One firm said they'd only submitted one and thought it took them about 20 minutes. Most firms said several hours, and the most we were told was 20 hours to, to submit a SAR. And that doesn't take into account all of the extra work which we know goes on in terms of answering any queries from the National Crime Agency, dealing with the client in the meantime. And one firm navigated this well with the concept of chargeable and accountable time. So chargeable time was the time working on files, so billable time. And accountable time was work that was not billable, but benefited the firm in some way. And both types of time recorded went towards that person's monthly target. And so it was recognized the time that they take up doing these roles, which we thought was good practice. So it's evidence um, by the quote on the screen that firms consider it important that senior management know what you're doing um, and that you're given appropriate priority to other roles. And firms can help AML officers discharge their duties by trying to limit the amount of additional roles they hold where possible, reducing fee earning um, and case working targets with a regular review, and also appointing dedicated staff to share the burden and carry out more routine AML tasks. And AML officers can help themselves by delegating responsibilities appropriate and appointing a deputy. And as you can see from the final soundbite from a firm, officers can help themselves by maybe using technology to free up resources, such as delivering training online or having uh, materials available on the intranet. So the final thing we considered as part of the project was appointing uh, a deputy. And around half of the firms we contacted didn't uh, have a deputy. Appointing a deputy can be central to a successful AML regime, as it can help in terms of providing holiday or absence cover. Uh, it can also be a helpful tool in terms of succession planning. We saw some firms had deputy MLROs that at a later stage stepped into the shoes of the MLRO and had that knowledge of the firm a second pair of eyes and ears in detecting money laundering and terrorist financing, and also a trusted and understanding colleague to act as a soundboard for these role holders. And some firms where they separated out the roles, they deputized for each other, which worked well, um, and others delegated to compliance officers or other partners. We were concerned to find that of the 30 AML officers we spoke to, 20% uh, said they didn't need a deputy as they were con always uh, contactable. And we're concerned by this, it's potentially short-sighted, as in the case of serious illness or injury, the AML officer may not be able to answer calls or access emails. If they're abroad, there may be confidentiality issues. And with a lot of this stuff, particularly, for example, making a report, time can really be of, of the essence. So this also leaves aside the obvious, poor, uh, obvious point about taking time off is crucial to everybody's well-being. Um, and so you do need to you know, set aside time and uh, the ability to do a good job will be based on having some rest at some point. Um, and of course, for sole practitioners, this is extremely challenging because all of the work rests on their, their shoulders. So there's no set mechanism for appointing a deputy. You don't need to formally notify us, but having that safeguarding place it is advised. And as you can see from our own MLRO's thoughts, a deputy can act as a really uh, important second line of defense and assist with delegating appropriate parts of the role, such as helping out with training or assisting colleagues. So I'm gonna hand over now to Natalie, who's gonna share her experience as she was one of the firms we visited to assess their compliance and also these roles. Right, so here I am. I'm Natalie Maloney. Um, good morning. Um, I was thrown into the MLRO, MLCO role at Heinz um, this year, um, and shortly thereafter, I got the lovely letter telling me that they were coming in. Um, so I'm sure quite a few of you will be sympathetic to that. 
that letter didn't come with a warning that I'd now be on this stage as well. So <laughs> I've had a bit of a year. Um, anyway, so I work at Heinz. Um, I'm a partner. I became a partner in 2019. Before that, I was at Barker Gillette, where I was a trainee in the West End, and then I became a partner, um, and I took a career break. I specialize in dispute, regu um, dispute resolution, regulatory work, and clinical negligence. And I have to fit in my MLRO, MLCO role as well, which I'm sure many of you appreciate is a juggle. Um, as I said, we were audited in September of this year. So headlines like that, we've all seen. Let's not be ostriches um, and let's get ready because as Colette said, they're upping um, their visits and you very well may be visited this year. Um, so there are small firm advantages. I don't know if many of you are from small firms, um, but having that hands-on, you're a Fiona yourself, does actually help. Um, and I found that working with Ross, who was our auditor, and making sure that he got everything on time, really did set us up to have a productive audit. So I'm here because I was asked to give my top tips um, for the audit and how to get through it. Um, so I'll whiz through them and try and not take too long. Um, Three-letter acronyms, given our roles, there are hundreds of these that you need to learn. Um, so make sure you do. Um, risk assessments, this is one of their big um, areas. Make sure that the Fianas keep this going throughout the action. Make sure if things change, instructions change, that this is flagged and you may well need to adjust your risk. The firm-wide risk assessment. When I realized we were being audited, I went right back to this and everything else flowed from it. So make sure that this covers who are your clients, where are your offices, what risks do you actually have? Um, and I think that was one of the things that um, they did like, because um, I'd gone into that in detail. Also, please make sure that you update it, as Colette said earlier, the 2019 amendment regulations and also the national risk assessment. It looks massive, but actually chapter 10 is not that bad. So if you go into chapter 10, you'll get some helpful stuff from there. The independent audit, as Colette said, we didn't use um, external body to do this. It was our senior partner. Um, he flagged up issues that we, we were too tick boxy. So we changed that. Um, and make sure you act on your recommendations from the audit. Um, your PCPs, obviously they need updating in line with the firm-wide risk assessment. Staff screening, as Zoe said, this is another area. Um, and there are a lot of free resources out there. So we're using Google Checks. And actually, from our audit, they explain that you can check for a Section 43 orders, and you can also check your staff if they've got any regulatory issues that they haven't told you about. So we do that now. We send a letter to the SRA just before we renew all our practicing certificates, and that's all stuff that we've put in place. Right. Training, make sure you record your own training and that you're recording everything that you're doing for the firm. And again, there are loads of free resources out there, which obviously is very helpful. IT, now my IT manager and I, I'm not very IT savvy, but we sat down and he really helped me. There was so much in our case management system, which I never would have realized could have helped me in this role. So we introduced things that were user friendly and he helped removing some of the tick box mentality. Source of wealth, source of funds, as we've mentioned already, make sure you do this early on. Nothing is going to annoy your client more than you suddenly start asking these questions towards the end of the transaction. Red flags, obviously these change over time. New red flags come up. Make sure you're educating your staff. And one thing I do is I send every couple of weeks a horror story from the Gazette to my staff just to say, here's another thing. Have you been checking? Um, so that's a useful thing to do. We all know Tax Advisor now is much wider, so we just have a firm-wide approach. Everybody is treated the same, and that's, it's just much easier than having to keep checking who is and who isn't. Um, electronic verification, obviously we're all using this a lot more, especially with COVID. Um, make sure your FIANAs are reading the reports, and make sure when you're checking their files that you check if there's anything in there um, that they should have flagged up. 
Um, and again, bank statements, for example, make sure you're actually looking. How did this person manage to save all this money? It, it, you know, could they have done that on the salary that they're on? Um, reporting concerns. Now, my IT manager came up with this fantastic newfangled thing. Everyone hated it. So we went back to email and we went back to my good old fashioned spreadsheet. So make it easy because this is what you need. You need your Fianas to tell you what's worrying them. And finally, you'll be glad to know, documenting. You know, we all, as we're doing these things, we think about it, but are we actually writing it down? You need to have that trail so you can go back over it and say, oh, I made that decision because. Um, so that's a, a you know, change of mindset and, and try and encourage your teams to be doing that. Well, thank you for listening, and, and I hope you have a good experience if you do get audited. Thank you. And welcome back. I hope you found that uh, recap of what we spoke about last week helpful. Um, so we've now got around 20 minutes or so for live questions and answers. Um, we've had a few questions for you, which I'll come on to momentarily. Um, but if there's anything that you do want to ask, you do still have a few minutes to get your question in using the link below. So do get any questions in and we'll try and make sure that we, we come on to those. Um, so why don't we kick off uh, with some of the, the questions we had towards the start of the session. Um, so I think the first one we had in was from Sarah. Um, and Sarah said, how can you verify identification for an older person potentially with no documents or online presence? Um, so I'll, I'll kick off and then I'll hand over to Natalie, if that's all right, to give a bit of a practical perspective. Um, so again, I think I would stress the risk-based approach here, um, that an older person, there is a reason that they don't have uh, standard identification documents, um, which can be explained away. Uh, whereas if that were a younger person, that might be something that might potentially raise a red flag. So I think in this instance, you'd be looking at what alternatives you could use to identify that person. Um, going through people they know perhaps um, and also with all of this make sure that you do record on the file your thinking at the time so that if we do come and audit you later on um, that there is an explanation on file as to why you've taken the the, the approach that you have done um, but Natalie why don't you tell us how you might approach that situation from a practical perspective Thanks, Colette. Um, one of the things that we potentially do is if the person was in a care home, we might ask the care home manager to verify who they are and where they're living. Um, if they're at home, then there should be some sort of household bills, even if they haven't got an up to date passport or driving license. Um, and potentially we might contact you to verify um, those, those sort of steps we take, if that's OK. Brilliant. Thanks, Natalie. Uh, so why don't we move on to another question? Um, so this one is anonymous. Um, so the question is, should a risk assessment be distributed to everyone in the firm? So why don't uh, I come to Zoe and then uh, Natalie, if there's anything that, that you want to chip in on that one. So Zoe, what, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, thanks, Keller. I think it's good practice to distribute the firm wide risk assessment to to the people in the firm, the earners in particular, so they're aware of the risk tolerance and risk appetite of the firm, which areas are considered higher risk, so they know which um, uh, types of work require enhanced due diligence. And I think it's also important to involve the key people when you're drafting this document or updating it. So speaking to heads of department or even the earners where they can express sort of what they've seen, what is normal activity for your clients, checking that you, you've accurately captured all your different types of clients and the type of work that you provide is really important. Um, and I know some firms may uh, combine their firm-wide risk assessment with maybe a business uh, risk assessment that has some information that wouldn't maybe be disclosable to different levels of the firm. Uh, but I think LSAG is quite clear on this point. You need to be mindful about, is that the right way to go with this? Would it save work actually having this standalone AML firm-wide risk assessment that can be distributed? Um, otherwise, you're going to have to reflect those things in your policies, controls and procedures in terms of which areas are higher risk and require enhanced due diligence or lower risk. 
Natalie, what's your thoughts? Anything to add on that one? Just that we do share ours um, and obviously it's a live document, so we're updating it if things change um, and very much we want input from the firm um, into what should be in that. So I think that's a good approach and it's, it's worked for us. Super. All right. Uh, let's move on then to the next question. Uh, so this one's coming from Rowan. Uh, and the question is, if you use an e-verification program to verify the identity of the client, do you need to see physical copies of the identification documents after? Um, so I'll pick that one up, I think. Um, so Rowan, no, I don't think you do need to be seeing physical uh, documents as well as using a program. Um, I think using the, the verification system is sufficient for the most part. Um, all of that, I think, is caveated with some of the stuff that I said at the session about using electronic verification systems to make sure you understand the program, uh, make sure it is working as you anticipate it to, um, make sure you're guarding against user error. Um, I think the only instance where you might uh, want to take additional measures uh, to get the, the physical documentation is if you do have concerns about the system uh, or if you are in an enhanced due diligence system uh, situation, you want to be getting additional information about your clients. So you might choose to do it in specific situations. Uh, but for the most part, I don't think you need to be getting physical documents as well as using electronic verification. So why don't we move on to a question about screening? Uh, so this is a question from Hillary, uh, who wants to know, in a small firm with a long-standing workforce who are very close in and out of work, what is the expectation on doing uh, employee screening checks? Um, so I'll kick this one off, then I'll hand over to Zoe, I think. Um, so I think the, the one thing that I would add uh, or, or kick off with is that bear in mind the reason that you're doing uh, checks on employees, uh, employee screening. Uh, we do have intelligence at the moment that criminals are trying to infiltrate law firms. It is a live threat. And that is something that really robust employee screening uh, can help you with. Um, screening is obviously dependent on size and nature of the firm. Um, so think about the nature of the work that you're doing. If it's high risk, uh, you would certainly still be wanting to do some screening. Um, but Zoe, over to you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Colette. I think it is relevant in terms of the size of the firm that you mentioned, Hillary, and sort of those relationships. I think it is that risk-based approach, as Colette says, we know um, this is happening. But you might want to ask yourself about the, you know, your staff, what role do they play in the firm? So, how, you know, could they actually be used to infiltrate the firm in terms of access to money is the most obvious one. So when looking at your risk-based approach, remember that um, screening is, is relevant to your size and nature. Um, and you're looking at the skills as well as the conduct and integrity. So hopefully with the skills, that's something quite straightforward. You can tick off by way of, say, your appraisal process, if you're doing that for staff anyway, more generally to check they've, they've got the skills for their job. And then in terms of conduct and integrity, you'll have to think, what risk do I pose? Um, you know, with with my staff, if I'm getting complacent in terms of the relationships we have and actually could I, you know, justify it if something went wrong with saying, well, I did take these steps to say my finance staff or my conveyancing staff that can authorise payments or whatever. So, um, you know, it's just showing that you've thought about it and, and your knowledge um, of the staff members would be relevant, but it's not the only factor to consider. Super. Thanks, Zoe. All right, let's move on uh, to some more questions. Uh, so this one, uh, I don't have a name for, so uh, it, it, it is anonymous. Um, so should MLCOs have a seat on the firm board or senior leadership team? So this was something that your team looked at as part of the thematic, wasn't it, Zoe? What, what did you find? Yep. So I think I think the starting point for this one is going back to the regulations themselves. So Regulation 21 requires money laundering compliance officers to be a member of um, the board uh, or senior uh, leadership team. So so with that one, there isn't really a discretion. There is with the MLRO. That's for a decision for the firm. Um, and we did find that the majority um, 
of firms ensured they were um, uh, even equity partners. They don't have to be, um, but that's sort of the starting point for a member of the board, um, if it is, say, uh, a company, a director or a um, member of an LLP, for example. You then need to look at, you know, if they're not going to be sat at that level, are they sufficiently uh, a member of the senior leadership team and involved in decision making um, to meet the legal requirement in Regulation 21? Perfect. Thanks, Zoe. All right, uh, let's move on then. So fermide risk assessments, uh, a question about that, uh, which would be interested in your views, Natalie. Um, so fermide risk assessments continue to be a theme that firms aren't quite getting right. How did you approach putting in place a fermide risk assessment, Natalie? I th Thanks, Colette. I think it was where I started, really, um, and everything flowed from there. So I think going right back to basics and making sure that it did reflect our firm and what we were doing um, and who are our clients, where are we based, all of those things. Rather, you know, we started, we did use the template to start with, um, but then we really did adjust it to reflect our firm and, and what we're doing. And I think that's maybe where people are falling a bit short. You, you need you need to adjust it for your firm. Is that OK? That's perfect. Thanks, Natalie. Um, and anything that you want to add uh, from what your team is seeing, Zoe, on uh, proactive supervision or visits? Yeah, I think just to, to kind of echo some of what you were talking about earlier and, and at the compliance conference, really, which is sort of the common things where people fall down, which is, um, they may be have started with the template, which can be really useful. Um, and obviously, we put one of those out ourselves and maybe focus on just the areas that we've identified in the sectoral risk assessment and not actually reflected all of the services they provide. So making sure that's reflective um, and also how you're working, particularly with COVID, um, talking about, you know, um, what measures you have in place with dealing with clients um, remotely. Um, is really important and having another read to see are you saying we don't do these things or we have very few clients that aren't based in the UK because then you need to go into detail of okay well who are those few clients and, and are they a low risk or high risk so just be mindful of talking about what you do do and what clients you do have as opposed to what you don't have. All right great um, so this uh, next question is also uh, anonymous. Um, so what red flags could be raised uh, rework, such as personal injury work, where the source of money is known, uh, perhaps from an insurer, and the recipient is known uh, where that's the client? Um, so why don't I kick that one off? Um, so the first thing I would say is try and be clear as to whether or not the, uh, the work is in scope of the regulations. So personal injury work, probably not going to be in scope of the money laundering regulations uh, unless you're offering some tax advice, um, perhaps about settlements or where you're setting up a trust, uh, perhaps to, to look after um, uh, settlements. Um, in terms of red flags, um, I think you would probably then, if it's outside of scope, be looking at considerations under the Proceeds of Crime Act. Um, so is this um, converting criminal property? And I think uh, personal injury work, you, you probably won't be wanting to know, is there a possibility of sham litigation here? Um, is the claim genuine? Is there a possibility uh, that both sides are known to each other? Um, but actually, in terms of the strict requirements of the money laundering regulations, um, as I say, probably not going to be in scope. Um, I don't know if uh, if anyone else has anything you want to add on on personal injury. Really I Perfect. All right. Um, so let's move on then. Uh, so this is a, a sort of technical question for Zoe. Um, what should I do if a role holder changes? Sure, thanks Colette. So the regulations require you to notify us if your money laundering reporting officer or compliance officer changes within 14 days. 
Um, so you need to do that via my SRA where you can um, change the details of those officers. But also our contact centre are very helpful. So if, if you have any concerns, you can give them a call. Um, we used to operate on a form basis. My understanding is they're now within the my SRA system to make it easier. But if there's anything you're unsure about, you can go through to the contact centre and they can refer you on to our authorisation colleagues to get that sorted. But it is important that um, you do notify us within that 14 day period and that you make sure that you have someone there to, to fill those shoes. So you're not exposing your firm to a risk, even if you're appointing somebody on an interim basis um, until you um, appoint somebody more formally. Um, but it is important for that continuity and, and reducing that that risk um, and also probably to flag, as, as you heard me talk about earlier, the, the benefits of having a deputy too. Super, thanks Zoe. Uh, so let's move on to independent audit. Um, so with regards to independent audit, do firms need to consider external uh, auditors to meet the independent audit requirement? Um, so why don't I just say a word or two about that and then Natalie, perhaps you could talk us through how you approached it. Um, so I think this is quite a, a common question about independent audit and I think it is one that, that firms find challenging um, knowing who best to appoint to, to do an independent audit. Um, as I think I said in the session, independent doesn't necessarily need to be external. Um, so it can be someone inside of the firm who wasn't involved in writing your compliance procedures. Um, you could also look at a variety of different people to do different bits of the audits. You could have a different person doing file reviews to who looks at your policies, procedures and controls. Um, for smaller firms, you might look at putting in place a reciprocal arrangement with another small firm, uh, whereby you both audit each other's uh, policies, procedures, controls and files. Um, and there are a number of external companies out there that offer this service if you did want to go external. But as I said, I would stress that it, it doesn't need to be someone external. Um, but Natalie, perhaps you can talk us through how you approach this with your firm. Thanks, Colette. So we did consider whether we'd go external and use consultants, but in the end we decided um, we'd do it ourselves and it was our senior partner who undertook it. Um, and because he hadn't been involved in the writing of the policies, he was able to realise, for example, we had too much tick boxing in our case management system. So we, we fixed that and changed that. So I think it's really important. And one of the things that Ross fed back to me was that we'd acted on our audit. So we'd done, you know, followed through on the recommendations. Um, so absolutely, it was okay to do it ourselves, but he was pleased that we'd followed up what we'd found um, needed changing. All right, great. Uh, so we're running shortish on time. So maybe uh, maybe just a couple more questions. Um, so I'll put this one to, to Zoe. Is it only firms that handle client money that are at risk? What's your view on that, Zoe? No, is the, the short answer. I think this is a, a common misconception or, you know, if we, if we find the type of work we do doesn't require us to have a client account, you know, the risk isn't there. Um, and I think that's for a couple of reasons. One is sort of the definitions in terms of the legislation of proceeds. The Crime Act is very wide in terms of what could constitute money laundering offence. And also that's then reflective in the preventative measures which the money laundering regulations put into place. So what is in scope? So, you know, setting up trusts or companies um, or, you know, doing some sort of activity that allows somebody to acquire an asset or acting in a transaction or tax advice now is even wider. So, so be mindful that, you know, off the back of your advice um, or facilitating a transaction, there is still movement of assets. It's not all, always about cash. So that brings you into scope of the regulations. And then obviously you can you can determine what are our appropriate um, measures to have have in place. So definitely conveyancing where client accounts are, are largely required um, is the higher higher risk. Um, so you may legitimately uh, determine that that your business is lower risk and that may be reflecting your policies. Um, but it's important to be mindful that doesn't sort of get you off the hook in terms of regulations um, and, you know, uh, criminals are, are always sort of adapting and evolving and, and will seek to use firms in different ways. So do be mindful of that. All right. 
And uh, I'll put the final question to Natalie. Um, so you spoke a bit about your SRA audit in your Colt session. Uh, how was it for you? Was it as you expected or was it different to what you expected? So thanks, Colette. I imagine people are very interested in that question. Um, so obviously it's quite um, daunting, the idea of it, but actually the audit itself on the day I found really helpful. Um, Ross, who undertook ours, um, gave me some really good hints um, and tips. So, for example, we're now carrying out um, searches using the SRA as part of our screening. Um, so that was something that we weren't doing before. So we do that now when we're renewing our practicing certificates. Um, so, yes, I've come out the other side, pleased that we've had it and had some helpful advice from him. So and also I've got the opportunity to do this. So thank you, Ross. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, that's really nice to hear. Um, so uh, that takes us to 12.30 uh, and probably time for us to wrap up. So we had quite a few questions that we didn't get round to. So sorry if we didn't get to your question. Um, we are resuming our AML lunchtime webinar series in January. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll have a look at those and see if there's any themes that we can pick up uh, and add on to a future webinar um, or pick up as, as part of those webinars. Uh, if you do have case specific questions about a particular transaction that you're looking at, don't forget that you can give our ethics helpline a call um, or you can contact them via web chat and they can offer their support. Um, so I think it's it's been a really great session. Thank you to our panellists. Um, but I'd love to know what you think. So in particular, did this format work for you and how could we improve it? Um, we'd really love you to provide some feedback. There's a link below your screen which you can give us feedback uh, via. Uh, so do let us know your views. So I think other than that, thank you very much for watching and we'll really look forward to seeing you again uh, either at a future webinar or uh, in person at Colt Coffer 2022. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.